Now, there is no justification for the invasion. I'm not saying that. But there are reasons for the invasion. In February, Russian President Vladimir Putin, with visiting Ukrainian leader Viktor Yushchenko at his side in the Kremlin, warned of what could happen if NATO missiles were to be deployed in Ukraine. It is frightening not only to say, but even to think that such NATO deployment, which cannot be excluded in theory, would prompt Russia to aim its missiles at Ukraine. Mr. Putin later said he is pleased with the discussions, but noted certain problems, such as Russia's objections to U.S. anti-missile defense plans in Central Europe and continued NATO expansion. The declaration that this process is not directed against Russia cannot satisfy us. National security cannot be built on promises. While there's no justification for Putin's war on Ukraine, it does not follow that there's no explanation for the invasion. John Mearsheimer writes that the trouble over Ukraine actually started at NATO's Bucharest summit in 2008 when George W. Bush administration pushed the alliance to announce that Ukraine and Georgia will become members. Protests in Kiev and Ukraine between November 2013 and February 2014, also known as Euromaidan, began on November 21, 2013. The trigger was the unexpected statement of the Ukrainian government that it did not want to sign the association agreement with the European Union for the time being. The protests changed into mass protests on December 1, 2013, after peaceful students' protests had been dispersed with excessive force by the Bakut Special Unit of the Ukrainian police a day earlier. The protesters demanded the impeachment of President Viktor Yanukovych, early presidential elections, as well as the signing of the association agreement with the European Union. On 8 of December 2013, hundreds of thousands of people took part in the demonstration on the Maidan in Kiev. Some media reported about more than 1 million demonstrators. Despite an above average police presence and eviction attempts, the protests continued. This is not Kiev at the end of World War II. These pictures are current. The longer the unresolved crisis in Ukraine drags on, the more radical this conflict becomes. The more the influence of radical forces is growing. They call themselves the spearhead of radical protest. Under the collective term right sector, various radical groups have found each other on the Maidan. Ultra-nationalists are there, activists who are dominated by pure hatred of Russians, even those who do not necessarily hail for the European Union. For their spokesman, the Russian Empire is the greatest threat to Ukraine, and they consider the European Union as an imperial formation that negates the nations and with its liberalism wants to take Christianity away from the Europeans. This group of demonstrators who come along in such an orderly manner comes from the Crimea, from the city of Sebastopol or from Yalta. Posters based on road signs say Stop Maidan. According to the polls, 45% of Ukrainians support this slogan, only 4% less than the Euromaidan demonstrators. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. Um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. So, uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I'm just thinking, in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. Um, I'm I, kind I, of... I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know. I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three. Then they also talk about to involve the United Nations. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because 
you can be pretty sure that if it does if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. Let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we can probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. I have no doubt after our meeting that President Yanukovych knows what he needs to do. More than 50 people were killed that day. The massacre would bring down Ukraine's pro-Moscow president, prompting Russia to annex Crimea and sparking a separatist movement in the east. I have three people wounded, five people wounded. I have one person dead. One come after me uh, with just a hunter gun. Hunting rifle. H hunting rifle. And uh, I, I saw the guy with a Kalashnikov. And uh, after that, uh, I come outside and uh, saw the other guys who was also with guns. Some of them lying on the floor, some of them uh, hiding after, uh, behind the columns on the second floor. I've spoken to a senior investigator at the general prosecutor's office here who's convinced that whoever was firing from the Hotel Ukraine was targeting both sides. He's gathering evidence that he says will prove that the massacre on Maidan on the 20th of February was the culmination of a carefully worked out plot, the aim of which was to cause maximum chaos. But, he says, his investigations are constantly being blocked by the courts. The people from Maidan and from civil society, they say that they know everybody who will be in new government. All these guys have dirty past. Regent's party was absolutely upset. They say that, well, they accept, uh, they accept this, that now there will be new government and there will be extraordinary elections. But there is enormous pressure against the members of parliament uh, that there are un <laughs> uninvited visitors during the night uh, yeah. uh, to, to party members. Well, journalists. Some journalists who were with me, they saw during the day that one member of parliament was just beat in front of the parliament building by these guys with the guns on the streets. I said to the party of the region's people, you have to go and lay flowers where the people died. You have to show mm -hmm. that you understand what, you have, what has happened here. You know, he ordered that to happen. There's quite a mm -hmm. lot of shock, I think, in the city, a lot of sadness and shock. Well, all the evidence shows... Uh, the people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that's, yeah. But, but it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets, and it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition, that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened, so that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers, they were, it was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. Oh, on the issue of uh, suggested NATO membership, let me just remind you of the statement uh, or the conclusion of the Bucharest summit of 2008. It was clearly stated that Ukraine will be NATO member. I would be happy to have this as quick as possible. They never thought that they had the German Democratic Republic. They always knew that that was Germany. They always knew that Poland was Poland. And reluctantly, they also knew that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania weren't really Russia, although it had been part of Russia for a very long time. But losing Ukraine is for every single Russian something that is very painful indeed. Slava Ukraini! Even the choice of wording is symbolic. Now, instead of the Soviet greeting, good health, service members address each other with Slava Ukraini, Heroyam Slava, or Glory to Ukraine, Glory to the Heroes. 
War against a well-prepared opponent that has all the means of destruction, this is the main interest of our partners from NATO, and they are very grateful for all the information we give. We have um, NATO advisors board in the Ministry of Defense, and we have um, joint vision, what should we do in Ukrainian mm -hmm. army to uh, build a NATO army here in Ukraine and to become a member, member state of NATO in the future. I have an optimism that that Ukraine will be a member state of NATO um, in um, three, five years. Hundreds of British paratroopers from 16 Air Assault Brigade have flown in. It is the largest British parachute drop in decades. They jump with Ukrainian airborne forces, creating an image that won't go unnoticed in Moscow. It won't go unnoticed? I don't think so, no. Uh, well, I certainly hope it doesn't go unnoticed. It's not that, that. That's the point. Yes. Um, yeah. I was actually present at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008 when uh, uh, all allies agreed that Ukraine will become a member of uh, NATO. And uh, we stand by uh, that decision and uh, decisions uh, taken after the Bucharest summit on the issue of uh, Ukraine's uh, 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 possibility to become a, a NATO member. So will you guarantee unconditionally that you will not invade Ukraine or any other sovereign country? Or does that depend on how negotiations go? Speaking of the security guarantees and what it will depend upon, or if something will depend upon the negotiations, our actions will not depend on the negotiation. They will depend on the unconditional compliance with the Russian security demands today and in the historical context. In this sense, we have made it clear that any further NATO movement to the east is unacceptable. We are not deploying our missiles over at the borders of the U.S. No. On the other hand, the U.S. is deploying its missiles close to our home, on the, on the porch of our house. What would the Americans think if we, for example, decided to come to the border between, say, Canada and the United States or Mexico? and simply deploy our missiles over there. We've seen five waves of NATO expansion. Now they are in Romania and in Poland, and they're deploying the relevant attack systems over there. That's what we're talking about. You should finally understand we're not threatening anyone. We did not come to the US borders or to the UK borders. No, they, they came to our borders, and now they're saying that Ukraine will also join NATO and they will deploy their systems there. Or not just NATO, they will simply deploy it on a bilateral basis. They will deploy their military bases and their attack systems. That's what we're talking about. We will do whatever we need. One, two, three, four, five. We have witnessed five waves of NATO expansion. Why can't they understand? What is unclear? I believe everything is clear. We are thinking about our own security. The months-long build-up of Russian troops on the border with Ukraine has turned now into an invasion. Ukraine under attack. Military bases, airports and aircraft have been targeted and bombed. The skies over multiple cities, including the capital Kiev, lit up, waking up residents in the early hours of Thursday as Russian artillery advanced. These attacks come after Russian President Vladimir Putin declared two separatist areas in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine as independent and said Russian civilians who live there need protection. We also hear pronouncements from President Zelensky saying, well, you know what, maybe we might consider neutrality as a possibility. There could have been voices before this invasion, instead of agitating for something that we knew our adversary absolutely hated and said was a red line. The Biden administration was flowing in weapons uh, well before the invasion. The, the first billion dollars that, uh, that the, the president committed to Ukraine did include lethal assistance and training and effort that went into getting the Ukrainians ready for this kind of war. Over the last eight years, the United States, Canada, Britain, other allies uh, really helped train the Ukrainians. That wasn't an accident. That was the work of the United States and so many other allies over the last eight years.